and welcome to Socially Distant Discover Nature. Hope everyone is keeping safe and staying more or less sane. We've got a lot to get through today, so I will crack straight on with the catch up. And the first thing that's been sent in is this butterfly sent in by Gillian from York. Now this is quite an interesting one. This is an orange tip butterfly. This is an unfortunately sexist named butterfly because it's only the males that have the orange tips. The females are completely white and can be confused for some sort of cabbage white butterfly, any other sort of white butterfly, except when they close their wings. So on the underside of the wings is this quite intricate pattern, uh, very beautiful. It's on both the male and the female and it's kind of a pastely marble effect and it's one of the great ways that you can tell them apart from other white butterflies. We've also had Emma from York who sent in this picture of a ladybird. Now this is a great one, this is the seven spot ladybird. It's one of our most easily recognisable ladybirds, probably our most common. Um, does what it says on the tin, it's got seven spots on it but the way the arrangement works, there are three spots on each wing case and then one in the middle that overlaps both. So that's where you get your seven spots from. And they are voracious eaters of aphids, green fly, so that's why they're known as the gardener's friend. So definitely, you see them in your garden, encourage them, give them a good thumbs up. Simon Judith from Kent, who sent us the amazing hairy footed flower bee footage from last week, have been experimenting with camera traps and they've had some success. So here's a photograph of Foxy Loxy that they managed to snag, and also a deer. I, I think it's a roe deer. I'm not really sure what other kind of small non-native deer might be around there, but if there's any deer experts watching, by all means, tell us what it is. We'd be happy to hear from you. I'm not making any jokes about squash this week. I'm just not. You can have too much of a good thing. Except in the case of Robinson squash, am I right? We've also had a catch up from Kathy, the ecotherapy coordinator who sends news and photos from St. Nick's Nature Reserve where we're normally based under normal conditions. Whatever those are, I've forgotten. But she sent in these wonderful pictures of all sorts of flowers. What have we got? We've got a primrose, snake's head fritillary, absolutely beautiful. We've got forget-me-nots, cowslips, lungwort, flowering gorse. Apparently, uh, as long as gorse is in flower, kissing will never go out of fashion. That's an old saying. Lesser Celandine that we saw in David's video last week, and Bluebells, the absolute sign of peak spring. Of course she sent in a picture of this uh, cuddly toy bear, which just fills me with a warm sense of eldritch horror. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not saying that we should definitely burn it before it eats all of our souls, but I have matches. On with the theme of today's episode, which is bee identification. Great idea, Phil. That's what I thought. I know lots about bees. I can do this. But, but do I? Do I know a lot about bees? Do I really? I, as lockdown progresses, I don't know if I know anything anymore. Is, is it okay to have pizza three times a week? Are crunchy nut cornflakes a balanced meal? Can I have Zoom meetings in my pyjamas? Who knows? I've been feeling a bit um, discombobulated recently, so I've been struggling to get my head around how to do bee identification. Um, should I do uh, a few common species that you can see out and about? Should I start at the very beginning? Bee, bee, ge oh dear god, no, not puns. No, bad fill, bad fill. No bee puns are allowed. I just don't know. So we're going to do this and see how it goes. We're going to start off by asking the question, what is a bee? Because how can we possibly start identifying any types of bee if we don't know what a bee is? That's my thinking. 
In evolutionary history, wasps came first, and many, many millions of years ago, I really should know the exact figure, I'm going to say 130 million years ago. We'll check that. But in the past, there were a group of wasps that decided to switch from their hunting predatory ways into gathering pollen and sipping nectar. This was with the advent of flowers, flowering plants, and since then, the two groups have been evolving together, flowers and what eventually became bees. So that's telling us where bees came from, but we still not discuss what they actually are. Now, chances are, in your mind, you will have an idea of what a bee looks like, and possibly it is something a bit like this, which is a yellow blob with stripes on and some wings. It's a blackbird giving me a funny look from up there. So this is probably what a, a bee looks like in, in your mind. And I don't blame you because it's there in all the, the cartoons, the marketing, the pots of honey. It's the happy little bee. From a biological point of view, that is useless. So we will let it buzz off. I'm so sorry. Bees are insects, and all insects have three body sections. I think we might have discussed this before. You've got the head, you've got the thorax in the middle, then the abdomen. And all insects undergo some sort of change, some sort of uh, metamorphosis at some point in their lives. That can either be a, a slight change or a real dramatic one, like the caterpillar into the butterfly. We've established that bees are insects, what insects are, roughly. Bees are also part of a group called Hymenoptera. Now this includes not only the bees, but also ants and wasps as well. I'm not going to lie to you, bee identification can be tricky, because there are many, many species of bees. There's over 270 in the UK alone. So there's a lot of them a lot of variety, and as this uh, collage from Sean, friend of the show, shows, there's incredible variety, uh, all sorts of sizes, shapes, colours, some of them look particularly wasp-like, like the, the nomad bees, so it can be tricky. But we're not going to get hung up about identifying anything to species level at this point. Put out your mind, we don't need it, don't need it, we don't need to put things in boxes just yet, we're just going to appreciate the bees as a whole. We're still honing in on what a bee is and how to recognise it, so we're going to have a brief look at how to tell it apart from other similar types of insects. Now to keep things simple and not to have this video ending up as about six hours, what I'm saying is going to be a lot of generalisations and as with most things in nature, Almost everything I say, there will be an exception to it. So as I said earlier, we've got over 270 species of bee in the United Kingdom, and of those, around about 35 are social bees. So these include the classic honeybee, and also your bumblebees, but there's a few others, and these are the ones that will live in colonies, and there's a bit of working together to a degree. There's also over 170 species of solitary bee. So these are ones that don't have any of that sociality. I'm not sure if that's a word. Probably is. We'll say that it is. So they're not, they're not social, and I don't mean like they, they don't like going out to parties or anything. But these are the ones in which the females don't have any workers. They don't have any help. They just have to go it alone. And this can include things like the leafcutter bees, mason bees, any kind of bee that's going to live in one of those generic bee hotels with uh, bamboo canes in. A lot of solitary bees in there. Finally, we've got around 75 species of cuckoo bee. Now, these are a strange bunch, and they make up most of the exceptions that I mentioned earlier. Right, I've edited out the bit where I realised I didn't know anything about cuckoo bees and went away and read something in this book, which I highly recommend. It's written by... Stephen Falk, amazing drawings by Richard Lewington. Just buy, buy everything that's illustrated by Richard Lewington. It's incredible. Uh, and it is the Bee Bible. 
There are cuckoo bumblebees that will go in and take over the nests of other bumblebees and kill the queen, dry or drive her away, and then get the existing bees to raise their own young. And then there's cuckoo bees that go after other solitary bees and will sneak into nests, lay an egg, hightail it out of there, and when that egg hatches out, the grub will kill the solitary bee host and then start eating its food supply. Pretty gruesome, but pretty clever, I think you'll agree. We've got an amazing example here sent in by Sean. We've got Goodham's Nomad Bee, which looks very wasp-like, and it is going after this solitary bee, which is the buffish mining bee. So it will sneak in, lay that egg, get out of there, and then let nature take its course. We'll look a bit more closely about identifying different features now and separating bees apart from other insects that look like them or act like them. First one to take account of is flies. And we're mainly talking about hoverflies, which have evolved to look like bees and wasps, but also a bee fly, which is a, has a very interesting life cycle. We've got some pictures here sent in by Cliff from the St. Nick's Wild Watch group. Now the bee fly will chase after, keep an eye on, tawny mining bees and will flick its eggs into the tawny bee mining nest and then they will hatch out and start causing chaos. There's a really interesting article on the St. Nick's website which I will put a link to in the description of this video. Highly recommend reading that. The bee fly can be confused for a bumblebee from a distance because it's quite kind of chunky and fuzzy and hairy just like a bee. And potentially that's because it's evolved to look like that so the uh, tawny mining bee doesn't get too suspicious. And we've got a great video sent in by Meg from York who found one in her garden. Hoverflies can cause a bit of an issue, particularly the big hairy ones that are mimicking bumblebees. So one of the ways to tell them apart, the main way, is to look at their eyes. So think flies, eyes. And all flies, including hoverflies, have these massive, big, buggy, compound eyes, which often take up most of their head. And if you look at the head of a bee, their eyes are much smaller, slimmer, completely different. So, flies, eyes. That's a good way to tell them apart. Another method of telling hoverflies and flies apart from bees and wasps as well is that hoverflies have generally really small stunted antennae which you can't, you can't really see unless you get a photograph where you get really close. Generally bees and wasps have much more prominent antennae which can be seen from a little way away much longer. We should probably mention wing number as well. Now flies only have one pair of wings, so two wings, one on each side, and the back where they might have once had an extra pair of wings is uh, these little lollipop like structures called hull tears which are potentially used for, for balance and maneuverability in flies. Bees and wasps on the other hand have two pairs of wings, so four in total. I'm not sure how helpful this is because certainly when they are in flight it's impossible to count the number of wings and even when hoverflies, bees and wasps are stationary still it can be tricky without a photograph and getting zoomed in. All of the information I am imparting at the moment is in this worksheet that I stole from some poor sap and uh, fortunately that poor sap was myself from the past. <laughs> Take that, past Phil. So yeah, if you want to look at past Phil's identification chart, I'm going to ask Ivana to put it on the St. Nick's website. That's really good. Those are a few pointers to separate flies and hoverflies from bees and wasps as well. But how do we separate the bees from the wasps? This is where it can become tricky and sometimes you need to look at the behaviour rather necessarily than the appearance. So, bees, generally hairier than wasps. Not always, but generally. 
Many of these hairs are specially adapted to carrying pollen, so for example, many bees on a section of their hind legs will have what are called pollen baskets, which are bristles that they pack the pollen onto and carry it off. And you can often see this on bees, especially bumblebees, when they've got these big little kind of bright coloured balls, like uh, sacks of colour, on the back legs flying around. Not all bees do it on the back legs. Uh, things like leafcutter bees, they've got special hairs under the abdomen that they will store the pollen onto it. Wasps do not carry pollen except when they get completely covered in it as a dusting when they go into things like Himalayan balsam and it comes out looking like someone's tipped a bag of flour over it. But you will never see a wasp scraping off pollen and packing it onto its hind legs or under its abdomen. Never happens. If you see an insect flying around and it's got little blobs of colour on the hind legs, it's not a wasp. So wasps never carry pollen. Unfortunately, we can't say that all bees carry pollen, because if you remember, the exceptions, the cuckoos, they don't do any gathering for themselves. They get other bees to do the work for them. Also, we should note that in social bees, the males, the drones, do not contribute anything to the colony. They do not gather food, nectar or pollen. They're only interested in eating and sex. Curious. So to summarise this rather long, complicated and ever so slightly rambly section, if you see a bee or wasp-like insect flying around and it's carrying pollen, either on the hind legs, under the abdomen, we see it gathering it from the flowers, it's definitely a bee. If it's not gathering pollen, you can't say for certain that it's a wasp, because it might be one of those exceptions, it might be one of those cuckoo bees, or it might be a male bee. So it will require further investigation to determine the truth. Earlier I mentioned the three general grouping of bees, the social bees, the solitary bees, and the cuckoos. Now I'm just going to give a couple of examples of each group just as a primer and to add some more information. In the social grouping you've got your classic honeybee, which can be sometimes tricky to recognise because most of the branding you think is going to look like this, when actually it looks a bit like a brown wasp. We've also got bumblebees in here as well, the big, chunky, furry, sort of lumbering flight, quite loud noise. Many of them are your classic black with yellow stripes as well, but not all. In the solitary bee category, we've got things like the hairy-footed flower bee that we saw last week, and also mason bees and leafcutter bees as well, which are very interesting and very cute when they snip a little section of a leaf out, take it back home and form it into a, a special cell into which they lay an egg, stock it with pollen, seal it up, repeat again and again. And it's just the female who's doing that, because remember, solitary bee, she doesn't have any workers, she doesn't have any help, she's just going it alone. The final category, the cuckoo bees, our bunch of curiosities and misfits, we've got this Interesting picture sent in by Sean, which is a Vestal Cuckoo Bumblebee. So these are cuckoo bumblebees that will go into a bumblebee nest, remember, and they will take out the queen and then get the existing workers to rear the cuckoo bumblebees brood. We've also had this interesting video sent in from Rue from York, who spotted this unusual bumblebee, which I think, again, is a cuckoo bumblebee not quite managed to work out what species yet. Again, if there's any bee experts watching, do let me know. That finishes our introduction to bee identification. But before we move on, I've got a question that was sent in by Jack from York, and they were asking, how many bees does it take to make a jar of honey? Now I've tried to do some calculations on this, and it will involve me reading them out from a clipboard, because they're quite complicated. So, I don't have much footage of honeybees, so I'll just plaster some footage of flowers, so you don't have to watch man reading clipboard. The Beekeepers Association says that in a very good year, a hive can produce 27 kilograms of honey. 
Honey Farms website, feel free to check that one out, says that queen honeybees will lay 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day during the honey production season. So we'll class that as 1,500. Honey production season? Well, my beeline website says you should probably harvest your honey kind of August time and I've guesstimated that the start of the honey season is probably March when there's lots of flowers out. That might be wrong. So we'll presume it's March to August and that represents 184 days. If we take the 1500 eggs laid each day by the queen and times that by the number of days in the honey production season, 184 days, then we get 276,000 eggs laid in the honey production season. If we presume those 276,000 eggs all turn into owl bees, which is a massive assumption, and they definitely won't, then we've got 276,000 bees contributing in some way to the production of that 27 kilograms of honey. Now, a jar of honey from Tesco or other shops, whatever, seems to be about 0 0.4 kilograms in weight. 27 kilograms divided by 67.5 gets it to 0 0.4 kilograms of honey. So to work out how many of those 276 bees are making that jar of honey, we need to also divide that by 67.5. And that gets us 4,088 bees making one jar of honey weighing 0 0.4 kilograms. So that's some rough calculations. Uh, they're almost certainly wrong. I looked up on another website, someone who'd done this themselves, and they estimated that it was <laughs> 1,152 bees to make a jar of honey. So mine's a bit high, but we made the assumption that all of those eggs, those 276,000 eggs, would turn into adults. That's probably wrong. And picking a random scientific paper from the internet, they had a hatching rate for their bee eggs, they said about 48.6 of the eggs laid by a queen hatch. So we go back to our 4,088 bees making that jar of honey. Let's presume that actually only 48.6% of them survived to adulthood, hatched from an egg. So that brings the total down to 1,987 bees to make one jar of honey, which is closer to what the uh, the Bee Hour website said. So the short answer is, we can't really be sure, but the long answer is, it might be 1,987 bees. I hope that has made some form of sense, because the more I speak it out loud, the less sense it makes to me. Finally, I asked last week what you guys are doing to stay grounded and present and calm during this difficult time, and Emma from York sent in a picture of her cat, Snowball, and they say they're spending a lot of time with their cat and the pets are really good for helping them remain calm. I thoroughly agree. Unfortunately, I don't have any pets, but what I've been doing is uh, befriending blackbirds. So I mentioned Beaky last week. Beaky's becoming quite friendly, but also, randomly, when I went for a shift at Brunswick Organic Nursery, planting some lettuce, I had a, a different blackbird, which was also quite tame, come and say hello. And it's almost certainly, definitely, not the same blackbird, so we'll call it Beakerton Junior or something like that. But it, it came to say hello, and that was really sweet, so I'm getting a lot of a lot of positive vibes from befriending the blackbirds and I know they will just view me as a source of food or a, an environmental disturbance or just something that moves the soil around to expose worms. I don't care. I love them and they are my friends. <laughs> Next week's episode... I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what day of the month it is. I was going to do a dawn chorus episode. So. If there's only one Tuesday left in April, then we'll definitely be doing a Dawn Chorus episode. I should probably check that. Professionals at work here. I've checked. 
There is only one Tuesday left in the month, so I will definitely attempt to do a get up early and record some dawn chorus. But also, I'd quite like to stick with the bees, so we might throw in a little bit of bumblebee identification as well next week. We'll mix things up. It'll be fun and complicated uh, and marvellous. All of those things. Yes. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I'd love to hear from you with your pictures, stories, artwork, anecdotes, anything. Send it all to the usual uh, address if you're a Discover Nature participant. Everyone else, it's uh, ecosapienshow at gmail.com or you can find us on Twitter as well. Stay safe. Um, stay sane. Bake banana bread. Apparently that's quite popular at the moment. And yeah, good luck. Thank you for watching. I've never met anyone you would describe as combobulated? Is that even a word? Maybe that should be my life goal. By the end of lockdown, I will have become combobulated. I'll drink to that. <laughs>